There's a lot of different historical contexts that we can consider when we think about the Hunger Games trilogy. The most popular, of course, being classical texts that influenced Suzanne Collins in the first place. This video is going to look at the idea of agitprop propaganda, popular culture, as a tool towards social justice. Thinking about the girl on fire as Mockingjay, but also as Survivor. So the girl on fire and the Mockingjay both have cultural significance both in fiction as well as reality. As we follow Katniss through the Hunger Games and through Catching Fire, we see that she narrates her story, which is of course a, a power that the movie takes away. Fire is used to express her power and her defiance. She sparks a rebellion, she blazes her own trail, and she's largely unaware of the larger movement of rebel, rebels that she's a part of. She becomes a survivor several times over, and then she becomes the Mockingjay, which is something different than the girl on fire. She becomes the symbol of the rebellion, and is manipulated to achieve the rebellion's goals. So a lot of readers find that Katniss has a lot of power and empowerment in the first couple of novels, and they, that starts to get mitigated in The Mockingjay. Does Katniss still have the same kind of power? Or is it different power? She does have power and influence as that symbol of The Mockingjay. So looking at a historical moment to give us some perspective, we're going to look a little bit at the 1930s, and there's another PowerPoint that has a little bit more historical context, particularly about modernism and this period that the 1930s falls in. So we want to think a little bit about a cultural movement for social justice and an end to fascism, racism, sexism, and oppression of all kinds. Thinking about the cultural front, mass movement plus mass, mass culture equals the cultural front. So we'll look a little bit more closely. The 1930s was a period where there was a lot of radicalism in, in the United States. This was assumed to be a temporary response to a particular moment, the Great Depression. But one writer has written that by the late 1930s, a remarkable range of writers, intellectuals, and artists had some connection to the left and to the left's cultural initiatives. Sometimes this is referred to as the popular front. So the popular front has the idea of social movement plus popular culture, or different political uses of popular culture. And certainly the 1930s was, the, was not the first time for that idea to develop. But as we see mass culture really developing during this period in literature, film, art, and music, for instance, we see a lot more potential power in those uses of popular culture. We also see a lot of community-based social movement and accusations against this movement of being all politics and no art, for instance. We also often see um, accusations of this kind of failure of radical politics, but really the radical politics of this period very much influenced the radical politics of later periods, um, the old left influencing what is now the, called the new left. Um, again, this is the, the short version of this very complex layered history. So the popular front used this term agitprop, which is agitation plus propaganda. And so I want to just pause for a moment to think about this definition of propaganda. We often use propaganda in a derogatory kind of way, and so certainly propaganda can be derogatory, manipulative, um, but really the term propaganda can be used in a different kind of way. So I find it interesting that when you Google propaganda, what comes up as the most dominant definition is this definition here on the left that is um, noted as being a derogatory use of the word. And it says, information, especially of biased or misleading nature, used to promote or publicize a particular political cause or point of view. I think this definition in and of itself might be considered propaganda. A much more accurate definition, which kind of surprisingly comes from dictionary.com, is propaganda as information, ideas, or rumors deliberately spread widely to help or harm a person, group, movement, institution, nation, etc. We might also think of propaganda as the deliberate spreading of such information or rumors, and the particular doctrines or principles propagated by an organization or movement. We can also think about the, the physical propaganda itself, the art, whether that's visual, performative, or digital, and the art being used to spread such ideas. So agitprop for the popular front had political origins in the anti-lynching campaigns of the times, had social origins in the working class musical culture of hot jazz and swing. It was also part of a larger political group of radical singers and musicians of what was often referred to as the cafe society. 
and it's often dismissed as mere nightclub performers. Billie Holiday was one artist whose work was part of the cultural front. Her song Strange Fruit is often referred to as an example of agitprop'd. It was a representative of the popular front and an anthem of early civil rights movements. Billie Holiday was seen as a kind of spokesperson. We can hear the haunting quality of this song, and she performed the song night after night before an enthralled audience of young white intellectuals, or what was referred to as her supper club, following. So the song was really moving and really brought a lot of people into the movement, but it was also widely criticized, again, as agitpropped, as agitation plus propaganda, as one critic puts it, as moving propaganda perhaps, but not poetry and not art. And I think we can see the obvious connection here that it's easy to, to dismiss popular culture, like YA dystopian fiction, as being something that's, that's not political. But in fact, everything is political. All art is political. All writing is political. And we really can't divorce art and politics, so why not use art and politics together? So the radicalism of the 1930s is assumed to have evaporated with the defeat of fascism and the return to prosperity after World War II. But if this is the case, then it's kind of interesting that it takes this ongoing oppression to maintain that so-called evaporation. For instance, McCarthyism in the 1950s, Cointelpro in the 1960s and 70s, conservatism in the 1980s and 90s, and patriotism in the 2000s. So what kind of propaganda, or agitprop, is the Hunger Games trilogy? We might consider the books versus the films, and we might also think about how this propaganda functions within the book's fictional future, as well as in our own time. And of course, there are certainly many different ideas and causes that can be argued via the Hunger Games. For instance, some people argue that the Hunger Games is nothing but right-wing propaganda. Maybe they're right. One author writes, both Divergent and The Hunger Games are fundamentally works of propaganda disguised as fantasy or science fiction. They are propaganda for the ethos of individualism, the cent central ideology of consumer capitalism, which also undergirds both major political parties and almost all American public discourse. It's an ideology that transcends notions of left and right and permeates the entire atmosphere with the seeming naturalness, naturalness of oxygen in the air. But both sides in this fictional future world have their propaganda, and both sides in our real world have their propaganda as well, even though this analysis of the Hunger Games and of this propaganda as the ethos of individualism cuts across those two sides. So the capital, the oppressive government of this future world, has their version of propaganda. in our world as well. And the rebels have their versions of propaganda as well. In the third book, Katniss is used as a symbol of the rebellion in a series of propos. This is really the agitprop of this future dystopia. The Hunger Games even has its own version of Strange Fruit. In this Hanging Tree song, we also hear that haunting quality that we heard in Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit song. And the Hanging Tree in the film, Mockingjay Part 1, has also inspired a ton of fan art, and this is just a few samplings of those examples. And some more questionable versions as well. 
So this version, this Rebel remix of The Hanging Tree, has been pretty controversial. There's a lot of um, fans that say, you know, this is what the Capitol would have done to Katniss' song, and they're not wrong. Um, we can see that manipulation of this symbol of the hanging tree and the artistic representations being used in a variety um, of different ways that seem to be more in line with the Capitol and less in line with the kind of moving picture that uh, the song itself portrays. But the rebels prevail after much bloodshed and after the Mockingjay becomes the literal girl on fire as Katniss is badly burned as she watches her sister die. We use up our symbols. Both Billie Holiday and Katniss are, are used up in their contexts. Billie Holiday suffered from addiction and poor health and she died poor and in dire circumstances. A New York Times writer notes that she had been strikingly beautiful, but she was wasted physically to a small, grotesque caricature of herself. The worms of every kind of excess, drugs were only one, had eaten her. One of her early producers, John Hammond, said, artistically, the worst thing that ever happened to her was the overwhelming success of Strange Fruit. That's a lot of pressure that comes with being a symbol for a whole movement, and Katniss knows that pressure, too. She suffers from PTSD and lives her life in recovery. No one quite knows what to do with her after the war, as if they did before, and as the book says multiple times. She notes at one point that every emotion I have has been taken and exploited by the Capitol or the rebels. So Katniss has been used by both sides, and again, she's been used up. We use our fictional characters in this world in ways that aren't really all that different from the Capitol and the Rebels in the Hunger Game trilogy. But Katniss and many other girls on fire are survivors. I have a few quotes here from a recent book called Survivors on the Yoga Mat, and I think it's really interesting to, to look at this idea of the survivor in relationship to these books. Survivors are not, as individuals, the problem. Survivors are the canaries in the coal mine, not the poisonous gas that kills the miners. Of course, a very fitting analogy considering um, the role of mining in the film, and there is no relationship between the book, Survivors on the Yoga Mat, and Hunger Games, except those we make. Survivors do mo much emotional, physical, spiritual, and mental work to stay in the world, to be present that takes guts. We see in Mockingjay that Finnick shares a piece of rope with Katniss and then that gets passed on to Peta as well as they're all trying to stay present um, to work through the effects of being um, abused and tortured and oppressed. Survivors are sharers. Trauma survivors also understand compassion not just for themselves but for those who injured them. Becky Thompson also argues that absorbing the world's pain is both a quality and a liability since it places us at the center somehow, responsible for responding to and fixing all that is wrong. So if we go back to Parable of the Sower, we see this is very much what Lauren Olamina does. She absorbs others' pain, and this is a, an ability or a disability that she has no control over. Katniss, on the other hand, blames herself for everything that's gone wrong, even when she had no control over the origins or trajectory of the rebellion. She feels responsible for all of the deaths that she had a hand in, and she has a, a responsibility wanting to fix all of that, but being totally incapable. She does not have the, the power or ability to fix it, even though she does the best that she can. One of the unique survivor qualities is being able to sense that the world is on fire. The earth, our people, are in trouble. And this is one of the qualities that YA Dystopia can help us develop. Our world is on fire, so what are we going to do about it? We might think about the girl on fire herself as agitpropped in contemporary America, maybe. A lot of different varieties that we can think about. the campaign We Are the Districts, that even the AFL-CIO, a labor union that's been around for like 100 years, is getting in on the action. The odds in our favor, where we have, again, those consumer goods that we can buy and display, but also that symbol, the three-finger symbol, salute, as a sign of protest in the face of economic inequality, and people posting this on the internet in order to join the resistance and to have a call for action and to speak back to our current situation. 
Of course, this travels across lines, across the country. One of the detained Korean students who used the Hunger Games salute, she said that that three-finger sign is a sign to show that I'm calling for my basic right to live my life. So these, these books and these films do have a really powerful impact on the real world as well. So the fire burns on. Why a dystopia's contributions to the agitation and propaganda makes an impact, inspires people, raises consciousness, and perhaps the lines between fiction and reality blur and start their own fires.